You may have heard your wife or girlfriend recently get excited about a movie called It Ends With Us. Well, my girlfriend did take me to see this movie. And imagine my astonishment, imagine me processing what I was in for when I find out on the day of going to see this movie that it is based on a book by Colleen Hoover. Let me explain. If you don't know who Colleen Hoover is, I had previously read a book, an entire book, cover to cover, I read this book, with my girlfriend, the same one, a book called Verity by the author Colleen Hoover. Verity is about a woman who is pretending to be in a coma, and she's watching her husband bring this other woman into the home and start an affair with her while the husband thinks that she's in a coma. Going into as much detail about those explicit scenes that we know about the bite marks on the bedpost. Now, this younger woman's job is to ghostwrite. The older woman, the one that's in a coma, is a famous author, and the younger woman's job is to get inside the head of this author and finish her last book that was unfinished at the the time that she had her mysterious accident and went into a coma. And gradually throughout this book we get clues about a couple things as we piece together their life, the life of this husband and wife. We find out they have children that recently died. We find subtle clues here and there that the woman might be awake. And then we find this huge creative writing manuscript describing in detail how and why she started murdering family members. Now that book, from the creative mind that brought you Verity, I give you da 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 it ends with us. I would have loved to see the look on my face when I first realized that this film was based on a book by the same author, that very same Colleen Hoover. Let's get into it. Now this movie, I would put it in the suspense horror drama, the same as with Verity, and that's not to knock Colleen Hoover talent, like memes aside, jokes aside, about the actual plot of Verity. I did find the writing style to be talented at conveying an actual sense of fear, an actual sense of horror, at instilling that fear in the reader. I remember reading in Verity, oh, how did this object get moved? Oh, wow, look at this crazy manuscript. Wait, did something move in her window? Wait, did I just see her face watching while her husband is on top of me? Reading those parts of that book did actually, parts of it, yes, sent a shiver up my spine. And the same with watching this film, It Ends With Us, as well. I can only imagine what the effect would have been actually reading the book. I did not actually read that book. I have actually done a book review for something else that technically is in the horror mystery genre, the horror suspense genre. The author, Frank Peretti, I did a book review of his book, The Oath. If you want to start reading Frank Peretti, I would actually recommend you don't start with The Oath. I would recommend you start with This Present Darkness. But people do lump Frank Peretti in with the horror genre. I personally don't get it. I think his books... I'm not calling them bad writing by any means, but I think his books work a lot better. I consider them mystery suspense genre. Because throughout his books, there's a lot fewer spine-tingly moments, and there's a lot more uncovering clues to mysteries that seem a lot more elaborate than the ones that Colleen Hoover describes. And at the same time, I can, thinking back, I can recall moments in Frank Peretti books that seem like they should be spine-tingly moments, but they just didn't have that oomph. They just didn't have that flavor, the same flavor that Colleen Hoover is a lot more talented at putting across. And that's not calling Frank Peretti untalented at all. He is very talented at putting together those elaborate mysteries that the reader has to try to figure out along with the protagonist. But Colleen Hoover, I found that she excels at writing that type of horror. And she excels at writing themes which resonate with women. And um, that makes sense. She is a woman herself. I have not looked up any information about her life or her family yet. I don't even know how old she is. So I'm going into this review blind in that way. But anyway, I think I have talked about the author and about similar works enough. I think it's time to get into the plot. So this movie is about domestic violence relationships. As I was saying, Colleen Hoover excels at writing themes that resonate with women. The protagonist is a woman named Lily Bloom. Lily Bloom loves flowers. She is opening a flower shop in Boston. Wow, that aspect of the character is not two-dimensional at all. But honestly, though, looking at the dialogue and how the characters treat her name, it, it's the character is aware of how silly that fact is, similar to a John Green book. A character named Lily Bloom opening a flower shop and being like, yeah, I have a horrible name for this. It feels like a character that John Green would have written in that way. But this character, I applaud the opening scene. The opening scene is coming back home, talking to her mom, and we find out quickly that the father's funeral is 
is coming up, and the girl is having trouble thinking of what to say at the eulogy, and the mom gives a piece of advice, think about five things you liked about your father, write them down, and just talk about those when you're up there. So we see her write on a napkin, one, two, three, four, five, like she's preparing to write a list of five, but then she has writer's block with it, and we see her get up on the podium, and she has the napkin in front of her, still a blank napkin except for the numbers one, two, three, four, five. And she starts talking, but then quickly she says, I'm sorry, I can't do this, and she walks off. I think that was a powerful opening scene for this movie. Later on in the movie, we find out that the protagonist's father was physically abusive to the mother, not, as far as I know, not to the daughter. But the daughter grew up watching that, grew up watching her mother get hit sometimes. She quickly meets another character, a romantic interest, a man who happens to be a doctor, gets into a relationship with him, eventually gets married, eventually finds out that the owner of one of the restaurants that they like to go to is also another romantic interest, someone from her past, a high school boyfriend who joined the military and went away. But now he's back and owning a restaurant, and it's revealed that this high school boyfriend did spend some time being homeless at the time they were dating because he ran away from home because his father was also physically abusive to his mother. So now we're pretty on point with those two-dimensional characters here. The protagonist relationship with that doctor develops. They eventually get married. There is one scene where they're in the kitchen, they're cooking something, they realize something is burning in the oven. So they panic, it's smoking, the room's filling with smoke, smoke detectors going off, they're rushing to get it out. He reaches in there without an oven mitt, burns his hand, and she's right behind him, and from the camera angle that we get the first time that's shown, it appears that he's pulling his hand back fast, that like he burned his hand and he's accidentally pulling it back fast and the hand accidentally hits her in the face. So as the viewer at that point, we're thinking it's a complete accident and the protagonist thinks that as well. But of course later on they go to a restaurant not yet knowing that the restaurant owner is this other guy that she dated. The other guy of course coming from a domestic violence household himself and knowing that she is from a domestic violence household. He sees a black eye on her, and he sees a bandage on his hand, and he confronts them right away. But she, at this point, is under the impression that it was an accident, and so is the viewer, so he comes off looking like a complete dick. The second time something physical happens, it's also left a little bit ambiguous. It happens after that first boyfriend, the one from high school, approaches her one-on-one -on -one and expresses concern about the domestic situation and sneaks a business card into her phone case. The case on her cell phone, you know, you can take the case off, put a business card size thing in there, writes his phone number on it, close up the case again. No one will ever know, but if you ever need help, here's my number. Of course, Chekhov's gun comes into effect. The husband finds this. He gets angry, naturally. He storms out of the house. She follows him. They're on the stairs, and again, from the camera angle, from the perspective, it looks like a complete accident. They get in each other's way, and she ends up falling down the stairs, and it blacks out at just that perfect moment. And then she wakes up again, she's on the couch, and of course the doctor husband, neurosurgeon husband, is treating her head injury right there at home. Nobody else needs to know. That is one scene that I do applaud, this ambiguous nature of it, this being unsure of whether or not there's even a need to feel unsafe. But the film continues. And this next thing that's a catalyst for argument is also something that was hinted about much earlier on in the film. We got flashbacks from that high school relationship. Relationship. So the viewer is familiar, knows what they're talking about when that restaurant owner is interviewed for a feature in a local magazine, and he talks about an oak heart that he carved, a hollow heart-shaped oak thing that he carved from a piece of oak, a branch from an oak tree that he and she sat at and talked about while they were kids in high school having that relationship. He carved this hollow heart-shaped piece of wood and gave it to her as a gift, and then she later got a tiny tattoo of that heart shape on her collarbone. And the whole marriage, the husband never knew what that tattoo was, but he reads this feature in that local magazine just by chance, and he makes the connection, oh, this is what that heart shape means. He comes home, confronts her about it, and this is where we see Mask Off. He pushes her down on the couch, she is screaming no the entire time, and we think he's, like, initiating passionate love, but then the very next scene, we see her in a hospital bed with pretty bad bite marks around that tattoo 
tattoo on her collarbone. She's in the hospital without him, of course she ran away. And we find out from the nurse who's tending to her that, oh, bombshell, she's pregnant. She does spend a night at the other guy's house, one night, not sleeping together, just like getting, running away someplace. And then she goes to live with her mom, the husband for a little while, not even knowing where she is, but then finding out that she's with her mom. Coming to visit once or twice, helping her assemble a crib, stuff like that while she's still staying there, but the husband is doing something else with his day job. And it eventually comes to the climax of the movie, where she's in a hospital bed again, having just given birth. The doctor husband walks in, holds his daughter for the first time, and that is when the wife asks him for a divorce. And it is at this point that she looks him straight in the eye and says it how it is, gives the real reasons. If this little girl came to you, you being her father, and told you that her boyfriend hit her, and then at this point we flash back to the scene in the kitchen, a different camera angle where we can see he actually meant to hit her in the face. Then she continues, if this girl said to you that her husband pushed her down the stairs, and then we flash back to that scene on the stairs where it's more clear that he actually was involved in pushing her down the stairs. And then she continues, if this girl told you that her husband pushed her down on the couch and she was screaming no and he didn't stop, what would you do? And he says, well, I would tell her to leave fast as she can and never go back. And so he understands the reason for the divorce. That is the climax of the movie. There is a falling action. Falling action is taking the baby to the father's grave, her father, the father that used to hit her mother. And while she's at the grave, she leaves that empty napkin at the grave. So that's a great driving the point home part to the movie. And then at the very, very, very end, we see a couple years later, the daughter's a couple years old at this point, and she's at some local county fair or something like that, some event type like that, where just by wild chance, she happens to meet that restaurant owner again. Oh! And that's the end of the movie, so it's implied that she gets back with her high school sweetheart, and together with him, they raise that child. The first thing I will do is praise this element of the movie, I assume it's in the book as well, of keeping the viewer in suspense, of keeping the viewer unaware of that sense of ambiguity as to whether or not this violence was actually intentional, the violence from the doctor to the protagonist. The second thing I will mention that's well done is something that humanizes that character of the doctor a little bit. It's gradually revealed throughout the film, oh, they had, they being the doctor and his sister, the sister is a good friend of the protagonist. They, those two siblings, used to have an older brother that died in childhood, and we later find out from the sister that the older brother was accidentally killed when they, as children, found a loaded gun in the home and they didn't know what it was. They thought it was just a toy. Pew, pew, cowboys and Indians. Pew, oh, head blown off. And the sister tells the protagonist that later in the movie, but it's a callback to when the doctor character first is introduced. This film makes excessive use of Chekhov's gun, by the way. But when that character is first introduced, we see Lily sitting on the rooftop of an apartment building right after her father's funeral, and we see the doctor come up, obviously stressed out, kicks a chair over, and then they start talking about their mutual, why they're up there, why they're upset, and the doctor says he just got done with a surgery where a six-year-old child accidentally shot his brother in the head. He didn't know what it was that he was doing, didn't know that he had a real gun, and the story matches up perfectly. The details he gives match up perfectly, that it's very much implied. He might not have actually done that surgery on that day. He was more projecting his own past trauma onto whatever else he was feeling that day. So I think that part was well done. In hindsight, I do see a little bit of anti-gun propaganda potential, but I can let it slide for the sake of this film. I'm reading my notes only half in order here, so apologies if this feels a little bit disjointed, but the next note I have is a conversation that we see Lily having with her mother back when she's staying with her mother after running away from the doctor's home. Lily asked her mother straight out why she never left him, why she never left her father, because, well, it was obvious. She grew up seeing what was going on. And the reason the mother gives is it was always easier to stay. And I think that scene and that conversation, that thing to wonder about, is something that resonates with women. This this willingness to stay in a relationship where you don't even feel physically safe, let alone emotionally safe. And something else to notice about that scene with the question she asked her mother is something I think I see that character struggling with is her own self-image in this story of being the daughter of an abused wife and worrying that she's making the same mistakes her mother did of staying in an abusive relationship when it would be much better to leave. More on that later. 
All in all, I think the point that the author intended to get across was done very well. If anything, this felt like more of a sermon against domestic violence by the author. Which is not to say that's a bad thing. I think it was done artfully and skillfully, and I think that empty napkin that the protagonist left at the father's grave was a very skillful part of it. A very good way to illustrate that. Whatever other qualities you have as a person, if your child grows up seeing that type of household, it's gonna be hard for that child to think back and find specifically positive things about you, positive memories from you. And I think that tool for illustrating that was a great way to highlight the lasting pain, the lasting effect of sin, honestly, on that life. You know I love that Exodus 20 passage, sin is punished to the third and fourth generation. The effects of that domestic violence, that doesn't just affect your children, it affects their children because of their parenting style, etc., on and on. And let's be honest, it was only a matter of time. It's a B-list history film review, only a matter of time before I bring God and the Bible into it. Another place I will bring God and the Bible into it is a place that the author almost certainly did not intend for this connection to be made, but the scene where where the doctor husband is confronting that, or rather confronted by, that high school boyfriend who now owns the restaurant. This might not even be the perfect connection to make, but I couldn't help but think of, to, to think back on the Bible passage about Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman, you don't have one husband, you've had five husbands. Now, of course, properly understood, not all of that could be the Samaritan woman's fault. She could have been abandoned, she could have been cheated on, she could have been widowed. We don't know if there's infidelity there or if there was the husband giving the certificate of divorce there, but we do know that Jesus said she had five husbands, and this scene where one person she slept with is confronting and getting angry at another person she slept with, no, she does not have one husband, she has two husbands, and they are angry with each other, they are both jealous over her. Such things come from from sleeping around before marriage. Wow, never would have guessed at that one. I've made my point already, but another thing I want to mention and bring up is, a minute ago I said that this story is sort of like the author giving a sermon on just that one topic, a whole concise story wrapped up around the topic of domestic violence and a sermon about why it's wrong, and coming straight out of a book review about Tolstoy's Death of Ivan Ilyich. I could not help but be reminded of that book I just finished reading, because in the same way it is a concise story wrapped up around one central idea, that is, being aware of the guilt that you're going to carry with you onto your deathbed and what those final moments are going to feel like when you look back on your whole life and you try to figure out what your whole life was worth and what it was for. Properly understood, Death of Ivan Ilyich is a sermon on that topic, and having made that comparison, I couldn't help but think about the translation I was reading, the translation I picked for Tolstoy, that was Constance Garnett, and that translation is in 19th century English, so sort of old language. I personally like it because it feels more descriptive, it feels like it brings the scenes and the emotions to life more, especially Anna Karenina. But it made me wonder what it would feel like if it was more modern, more approachable, less formal language around this story, and made me wonder if that whole Death of Ivan Ilyich and Anna Karenina too, why not, if those stories would have felt a lot more like this if I had read a translation that used more modern language, more approachable and easily digestible language. But now on to the next topic. One final thing from this book that I do want to take note of is in that scene in the hospital room where she's holding the newborn and the husband had just walked out, the protagonist says something to the baby, says the words, it ends with us. And of course that's the title of the book and the film. Meaning that multi-generational trauma that I talked about earlier being the child of an abused wife and the child of an abused wife going back a few generations. Exodus chapter 20, you know how it goes by now. But one more powerful nail in the main point that's being driven home by this author is, the protagonist is putting her foot down saying, absolutely no more, I am ending this cycle right now. My daughter will not grow up seeing that. Religion completely aside, I want to talk about how book talk and Instagram and all these girls on social media talking about these Colleen Hoover books. You may remember back in the Twilight days, it was Team Edward, Team Jacob. Well, back a year or two ago when we were reading Verity, it was Team Manuscript or Team Letter, meaning the manuscript was the creative writing exercise where she described how the children were murdered, versus Team Letter, where she explains, hey, it, this, it was, this was fiction, it was creative writing, I don't actually feel that way, I loved my children very much, they died tragically in accidents, I did not kill them, the letter that we found at the very end. So with that book, there was this debate of whether to believe the manuscript or whether to believe that letter. And with this film, well, the book as well, it ends with us, 
I see, or rather I don't see directly, I hear about indirectly on social media, people being either Team Atlas or Team Riles, Atlas being the high school boyfriend, his name, and Riles being the name of that doctor husband. This tendency to pick teams with it and just, like, use those teams as a way to engage the audience of your book for fun, whether or not the author actually intended that. I sort of get it. I also sort of don't. It feels kind of weird from the outside looking in. I, I don't know, man. I'm just the boyfriend of a book talk girl. What do I know?